So our second speaker is Carlos Marti Gomez. He trained in biotechnology, bioinformatics, and molecular bioscience in Spain, where he completed his PhD. Now he's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the McIndish Laboratory in Cold Spring Harbor, and he's working with complex combinatory genotype phenotype maps and how to study the genetic architecture, RNA, and protein interactions and molecular evolution using these bioinformatical models. So thank you, Carlos, for agreeing to present. And if you're ready, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen first. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. OK. So th thank you for the introduction. In, in this talk, I'll be trying to explain the methods and tools that we are developing in, in the lab to try to understand uh, these complex genotype phenotype maps that Joanna introduced very well. And we do so by drawing in, uh, inspiration from evolutionary literature and this concept of the adaptive landscape, which was first introduced by Sewell Wright as this sort of topographic map in which points represent genotypes and uh, associated to each genotype, we have a height. So we have this language of, of, of peaks and valleys that you can we can use to describe the, what these landscapes look like in an in, in intuitive manner. However, we still don't have a very good understanding of, of what these shapes are in reality when we look at real data. Only recently, thanks to the development of these massively parallel assays that people are using a lot in this community, we can start to, to, uh, to, to tackle this question by measuring a, as a proxy different molecular phenotypes for a large number of, 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 of sequences at the same time in a single experiment. So as to summarize a lot of work, the outcome of many of these experiments can be often summarized in a table in which we have a series of sequences and their associated me uh, measurements. And uh, our aim, using tools like the Joanna, the, the ones that Joanna described, we can, the, our aim is to reconstruct the full combinatorial landscape in which we have every possible sequence of a particular length and an estimate of what the, the, the phenotype or the fitness is. And we can do that not only from this type of experimental data, but also from observation of natural sequences in a procedure that is called sequence density estimation. I don't have uh, much time to go into the details, but like you want to explain one of them and the other is also published if you're interested. So what I'm going to focus in this talk is how we can make sense of these large tables in which we have associations of genotypes and phenotypes in an intuitive manner, trying to reconstruct the representations that are intuitive and, and, and we can start to interpret that like the cartoons that I showed you in the previous slides. The main problem that this cartoon has is that it's not very realistic because genotypes don't look don't, don't live in a 2D plane, but instead they live in discrete spaces that can be more accurately represented by a graph where nodes are genotypes and these genotypes are connected to each other if they are separated by single point mutations. So how can we reconcile these two ideas, one that is so intuitive and allow us to use this language to describe them, and the realistic notion of the discrete space. So we can do that uh, by, by again thinking about evolution. And well, we, th we know that populations would generally tend to spend their time in, in genotypes that, are, that have high fitness. We can think about their evolutionary dynamics. So these populations would move very quickly between genotypes that are connected and are high fitness, but it would take much longer to move to a, to a, to a region that is separated by a fitness value. So what we can do is we can build representations that reflect more accurately these evolutionary dynamics. And in particular, where they represent genotypes at distances that are related to, uh, to the time that it would take for evolution to move from one genotype to another. Therefore, this is going to show very separately uh, regions of sequence space that are functional, uh, but are qualitatively different and are separated by these values. To show you how it, this would look like in a more realistic example, this is a plot in which we have over 200,000 genotypes. Each dot is a genotype and they are connected uh, to each other by lines if they are separated by single point mutation. And we typically use the color scale to represent how good a, a, a genotype is for this particular function. So we can see that the, we find yellow dots all over the place and they are very well mixed with the purple dots and it's very hard to, to see anything. 
However, as we apply uh, our visualization technique, what we are going to see is how these uh, yellow dots are going to be start separated into different regions, highlighting different qualitative solutions to this particular problem. Before going into more details about what this landscape is, I just wanted to mention that we have developed GPMAP tools, which is a, a software library that allows to perform inference using uh, experimental data and also observations of natural sequences. And once you have that, we can, we can draw these pictures to visualize them, which can be useful for many different applications. So for instance, we can use them to just do exploratory data analysis of these main data sets to draw uh, conclusions or uh, hypotheses about what the structure of the landscape is. And also we can focus on specific uh, aspects of evolution on these landscapes. And for the rest of the talk, I'll be showing you some examples of landscapes that we have analyzed with these tools and the different insights that we can get. I will start with the Shine Dalgarno sequence, which is a sequence that is located in the 5' prime UTR of uh, prokaryotic messenger RNAs. And this sequence is recognized through base pair complementarity by the 16S ribosomic RNA, which mediates the assembly of the ribosome, making this sequence a very important cis-regulatory element for protein translation. So we approach this, uh, this landscape by looking at the E. coli genome, which has about 4,000 genes. And we, ex we can extract the sequence of those uh, of their five prime UTRs, align them with respect to the star codon, and then extract these nine nucleotide sequences. Then, then we can fit to our sequ sequence density estimation procedure to obtain an estimate of their of, of the of the fitness associated to each possible sequence. And then we can do the visualization to try to interpret. So this is the landscape that I was showing you previously, in which we can see that yellow dots, which represent the highly functional sequences, are clustered in these three main regions that represent these different fitness peaks. So we can just simply look at what these sequences are, and it turns out in this case to be very simple, which because these peaks correspond to different positions of the same core motif, AGG, AGG, that can be located at very different at different distances from, from the star codon. This not only gives us the idea that the molecular mechanism of this system allows binding of the of the of the complementary sequence at different positions with the start side, but the fact that they are represented at different distance at large distances in this representation also tells us that it's very difficult to move this motif by one or two positions only using single point mutations. In contrast, it's easier to, to shift this core motif by three positions, as we can see, because they are represented more closely together. And if we pay attention, we can see that there is this extended reach of functional sequences that connects them. This happens in this particular case because of the self-similarity of this AGG, AGG motif, which allows these three bases that are free here to change to evolve an, another AGG and provide this sequence that can be bound at the same time in the two registers. So now these three bases could, could mutate again, uh, completing the functional transition, and therefore having moved this core motif by three positions without losing fitness at any point. This is an example of how uh, a path like that would happen, and we can see that this path traverses the, the extended reaches that we have described before. Another interesting feature of the Shane Dalgarno sequence is that we have experimental data to compare with. So some other people have uh, built this almost combinator complete combinatorial library that hey, they have cloned into the UTR, 5 prime UTR of a GFP reporter. And they have cloned the transfect that library into cells that they could sort according to fluorescence uh, intensity. And after sorting the different bins and sequencing, uh, they, they could get a pretty good estimate of how well each of these nine nucleotide sequences promotes translation efficiency. So once we have these experimental estimates, we can compare them to those that we have obtained from just observations of sequences in the E. coli genome. We see that there is a pretty good correlation, but we also can appreciate that there is a lot of variability. So the, the main question for us and what we think is more important is whether the structure of these two reconstructed landscapes for in principle the same functionality is similar or not. 
So if we plot the, the two visualizations side by side, we can see that they are actually pretty much the same. We can see the three main different peaks that correspond to the same different positions of the core motif. And we can also see these extended ridges of functional sequences that connect sequence, uh, the core motif shifted by three positions. So in general, uh, these, these two approaches for, provide very, very complementary methods to study fitness landscapes and can validate one another. In the second example, I'll be talking about a, a, a phenotype that depends on an interaction between two proteins. In particular, these two proteins are a toxin and antitoxin. These systems are pretty common in bacteria and consist of an operon that codes for a toxin to kill competing strains that live in the same media. But at the same time, they have to, pr to produce an antitoxin that neutralizes the toxin in, in, to avoid killing themselves. A family of such systems are the colicines, which have diversified over different species of bacteria. And in particular, we are interested in, in, do, in, in these two pairs of, prote uh, pairs of protein that are very closely related. Uh, we are interested in them because they, they are what we call functionally orthogonal. This is that the antitoxin of one of these pairs can only neutralize the toxin of that pair, but not of the other pair creating this sort of incompatibility that raises the question of how this uh, functional orthogonality can actually evolve in nature. And also uh, for our thinking, what are the, what are the constraints that the, having this orthogonality imposes in the, in the shape of these uh, genotype to phenotype maps of fitness landscapes? So we approach it by looking at only the 17 positions at which these two pairs of proteins differ in the binding interface. And because we don't have a lot of sequence diversity, we cannot use methods that, that like the one we used before. And instead, our collaborators took a computational modeling approach in which they were able to, to model the combinations of alleles at, at all these 17 positions, plus some additional alleles that are not seen in the two wild type sequences, and reconstruct this complete combinatorial landscape that they modeled in the, in the crystal structures of the two wild type structures. Uh, and we're able to calculate the relative binding energies with respect to these wild type structures. In addition to that, uh, they were able to compute low throughput experiments for uh, about a hundred of those sequences by purifying the toxin and apply them in decreasing concentration to the naive cells that are not expressing any, any toxin and verifying that they kill all of them. Uh, in addition to that, they, could, they can do the same experiment, but now uh, uh, with cells that are expressing the antitoxin or immunity protein. And we can more or less quantify what is the degree of protection that this antitoxin provides to each toxin in this quantity that we have called normalized MECA score. So we can, we can see that uh, we have measurements spanning the whole range of possible values of these experiments and the, the, bi and the biological replicates are pretty good correlated. But what is more important for us is that we were able to construct a model from uh, that only that only uses the binding energies computed with Rosetta to predict this specific score in these sequences. Uh, and we can see that we achieve very good performance with a correlation coefficient of about 0.92 in leave one out cross validation. And I want to highlight that the, most of the points are actually here or here, meaning that we can predict with very high accuracy whether they are very functional or, or whether they are not functional at all. So with this, with this model, we can basically transform our, uh, our estimates of the binding energies into this more biologically interpretable quantity, then then we can visualize using our visualization techniques. So this is what this landscape comprising over 2 million genotypes looks like, in which we can say where are the two extant species, and we can see that they are located at opposite corners of this representation. And we can also try to generate paths that connect them that we predict are going to be fully functional. And one such path is the one that I'm showing here, which was validated by, by, by our collaborators. And all of these uh, intermediates seem to work very well. When, when, when thinking about the structure of the landscape, the most striking feature that we can see is that they, they, it's separated in, in these three main clusters. And these three main clusters correspond uh, with the um, with a pairwise interaction between these two positions across the binding interface. 
So if we were to only look at the alleles, the allele combinations at these two positions and take the average of them, we can see that one of these combinations in general is pretty bad, which restricts the order in which these two mutations could happen in, in from one combination to another. Within each of the clusters, we can see that the red sequences, which are the ones that are highly functional in this case, are arranged in this sort of L shape around the, the blue sequences. One edge of this L shape is uh, is due to the an interaction between between and these three positions also across the binding interface, and although the picture is a bit more complicated than before, the summary is more or less the same. We have a few uh, we have a few of the intermediates that are not functional, and this prevents evolution to traverse this space in in in, in many possible ways, and restricts the order in which these mutations would happen. Uh, which effectively spreads out these sequences in the uh, visualization. The, or, the other edge of the of the L is, is can be explained by a high order interaction between this subset of positions, in which we can see that this, the, these two specific mutations that I don't have time to go into the details. In this particular background, when we are in this region, are highly deleterious, and we would never like see them. But as we move upward in this uh, in this in this edge, we would see that they become slightly neutral, or even <laughs> or even benefit synergistically beneficial. So we illustrating the nature of this high order interaction in this particular case, and explaining why the specific orders in which these four mutations would be implemented are actually implemented in the experimentally validated path. Once we understand the structure of the landscape, we can also do other things like trying to answer questions that are more specific to the system that we are studying. For instance, just to show you an example, we, in this case, we are also interested in the evolution of binding specificity. So we can think about uh, looking at the, using this representation to plot other things. In this case, we are showing the, <clears throat> whether this particular toxin, which is one of the wild types, can be neutralized by the antitoxin corresponding to each of the pairs. And we can see in red that all of these sequences in the top two clusters can actually neutralize this, this toxin, but not the sequences in the bottom cluster. And we can also, we can now do that, what, we can ask what happens when we implement a series of mutations in the toxin. And we can see that after one and two, two mutations, these sequences in the bottom cluster can also and actually neutralize better this, uh, this toxin, this variant, uh, better than the sequences on the top cluster. <laughs> so in general, this, uh, this landscape shows us uh, an example of how a protein uh, landscape could look like and specific interactions can be obtained from this highly combinatorial uh, space. So in the next example, uh, I'm going to focus more on what the impact for uh, what are the impacts of these structures in terms of evolution, and in particular, we are going to be focusing on what the, what's the impact of the genetic code uh, in molecular evolution of proteins, uh, and and we are interested in that because it's another factor that limits which amino acid transitions are are possible. So, for instance, we can see that from phenylalanine, we will never get to arginine through single point mutations. So, to do that, we need to have a different type of data instead of having. Uh, many different sites with few amino acids, we would need to go to the other extreme in which we have fewer sites, but with all possible amino acids. And we have that uh, in, in this specific data set that we, uh, that we know pretty well, which is the GB1 protein. This, uh, this protein is, uh, is supposed to bind the constant fraction of antibody and its binding affinity has been shown to greatly depend on the amino acid combination at this position. And what is important, and there is a, a very good experimental data set available that contains almost all possible mutations. So we have analyzed this data set in the past and generated the, the representation at the protein level, which looks like this, in which we can identify these three main regions of functional sequences that are characterized by their sequence and the third and last position, which are qualitatively different. In addition to this region, we can see that there are some clusters between them that can connect them and, pro and, and act as some sort of transition state between them. So for instance, this DG intermediate is the one that would allow a direct transition from this region to this region, 
we simply need to mutate this this amino acid to a G, and then the second the first G needs to mutate to either leucine or ferrin adenine. So now our question is, well, how is this structure going to change when instead of uh, looking at the protein sequences, we look at the DNA sequences that encode them, which greatly expands the number of sequences up to 16 million. So this is what I'm trying to illustrate in this animation where we can see uh, an interpolation between the coordinates of, of the visualization at the DNA level and the coordinates at the visualization at the protein level. We can see that some of these clouds of point of yellow points move quite a lot because they become isolated from some of the sequences under the standard genetic code. But in general, the main structure of this landscape remains mostly the same with these three functional regions largely separated from each other. If we plot only the sequences, the top 1% sequences, we can better highlight the connections between them and, and we can see, for instance, that these two regions that were before uh, directly connected through these GG intermediates now uh, are not very directly connected. And this happens because glycine and leucine and phenylalanine are not connected under the standard genetic code. So the GDG -G intermediate is no longer connected to this. It's, and it's actually one of the clouds that was moving quite a lot to, to the upper part of the plot in the animation that I showed you before. So instead, if we want to go from this region to this region of sequence space, we would need to traverse very long paths that need many, many, many point mutations. This is just one example of such paths that includes 11 point mutations and many amino acid substitutions only to change the identity of two amino acids. In addition to, to this, we, can, we could also see that the structures of some of these regions was slightly reshaped. So we could see in the animation that this region was quite elongated, and this happened because of the identity of the amino acid at the fourth position. At one end, we find alanine, which is connected, which connects with other functional regions here. And at the other end of this uh, extended reach of functional sequences, we find leucine. And as you may guess now, these two amino acids are not connected under the standard genetic code. So we need to go through other, other amino acids that would be in the middle to be able to connect these two types of protein sequences. Another uh, feature that we can see in this landscape that we think is pretty interesting is this, is this kind of low dimensional grid here. We, we, can, we can see uh, at one axis mutations at one position and on the other axis mutations at the other position. This highlight the somewhat independent uh, uh, evolution of these sites, even if the even, even if it's in this lo very localized region of sequence space, even if, in, if within each site the 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 order in which mutations could happen could be greatly restrained. In particularly, we can uh, in particular we can see that the threonine to glycine is not really accessible under the standard genetic code, but we need to go through a specific alanine intermediate for that to happen. So in summary, we have seen that the genetic code can, ha can have an impact on the evolutionary dynamics on these complicated protein landscapes and can create these elongated structures and grid-like dimension and grid -like dimensional structures. Uh, finally, to summarize, we have developed GPMAP tools, which provides very powerful tools to study complex genotype-phenotype maps comprising up to millions of genotypes and tell these simple stories uh, that we can interpret more easily. Uh, we have seen also that we have these two complementary approaches for inferences of complete combinatorial landscape and that they provide very similar insights in the case that we studied them. We can use, uh, like I'm showing here, right, we found the same peaks. We can identify genetic interactions of any order and generate a hypothesis about what the underlying biophysics are or understand specific aspects of molecular evolution on them. Uh, we could also start to address this question about what are the typical structures of that we see in genotype phenotype maps. And in spite of uh, many people having focused on this idea of the isolated peaks, which we could also see in the visual in, in the cartoons that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, we can see that it's actually pretty common to see these extended ridges of functional sequences, like I'm showing here, and 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 these grid-like dimensional structures uh, that uh, that that combine many of these reaches. And finally, we can see that these dissimilar uh, structures can be 
of ENCODES by very different or dissimilar molecular mechanisms, including overlapping binding sites, specific amino acid incompatibilities, or just the structure of the genetic code. Finally, I would like to finish by acknowledging everyone in the McCandley flat, previous and, and current members, especially David for his guidance and mentorship, Jos and Hannah for working with us together in this project about the influence of the genetic code in protein evolution, Sif and Sorel for introducing us uh, to this notion of functional orthogonality and start thinking about that, that in the context of fitness landscapes, funding agencies, and all of you for an attention. Great, thank you so much, Carlos, for that really wonderful presentation. Um, the time is a little tight for questions, but I just wanted to ask one real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I really liked, you know, how you analyze this experimental fitness landscape um, with the population variation in, in equali, right? The population diversity. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of curious. I, I don't think I saw this, but have you tried something similar with like human based um, Maeve data? Um. Not really. Like the, the we have we tried try to this... estimate the landscape and then interpret, I guess, you know, population variance, right? Mm. So, so this method, uh, we we can only do it for short sequences. Uh, so we have uh, also applied it, for instance, to the five prime splice site. It's ideal when we have uh, we have uh, the same genetic element that we know the position exactly well, and and we have many observations of them. So we uh, we can draw these inferences pretty well. We we are also starting to do that on on, for instance, alignments of proteins, looking at the specific regions that we are interested in. Uh, but which but. This method is not, like if you're interested in analyzing MAVE datasets, like the method that Joanna was was describing was more uh, specific for that. Is there is there a limit on the size of the input sequence that you kind of try to stick to? Yeah, yeah. So far, we we have done up to uh, like few million genotypes. So it depends on whether you have a protein sequence or a nucleotide sequence. You can do. It. 10 to 11 nucleotides and four to five amino acids. Great. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you so much. And um, you know, thank you to both the speakers for, for those excellent presentations. Um, and thank you to the whole audience for uh, attending this month's best. Um, be sure to tune in early in January when we'll have another variant effects seminar series. So thank you. Okay, thank you.